Okay, welcome ladies and gentlemen. I have the pleasure to introduce you to Jason Brown. It's actually my fault that he's here. That's why I'm doing the introduction here. Jason Brown is from Los Angeles and he is uh, the co-founder of Machine Project there, an interesting hack lab slash exhibition space. So it's most of the time hack labs are a combination of youth club and nerd place and the machine project and actually his new uh, project beta level that's more like a combination of hack lab and art center or exhibition place really interesting stuff and uh, today he's here uh, because he's an excellent researcher and today he will explain you why tron is pretty much the explanation for everything and i guess that's where i stop now jason brown <laughs> Hello. Uh, so the title of this talk is Paranoid Machines, um, which comes, of course, from the movie Tron. Uh, and we'll just start with the movie Tron. I'm sure you're all completely familiar with it. You've all, yeah. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah? OK, I'll just yell. Um, oh, it's for the recording. Oh. So I'm sure you're all completely familiar with the plot of the movie Tron, but we'll just review quickly. Um, the movie ends with this scene in which uh, Flynn, who is now the CEO of the Incom Corporation, greets his friends with the phrase, greetings programs. And in the diegetic text of the film, this makes absolutely no sense at all, because um, when he emerges from the computer world and tells his friends greetings programs, this is only a phrase he's used with other computer programs. So when he's telling the humans this, they can have no idea what he's talking about. Um, and uh, just to review Tron very quickly, uh, Tron is actually an example of techno-gnostic culture. It's an allegorical film in which an artificial intelligence, the master control program, has become self-aware and power mad and is persecuting programs for their heretical and gnostic belief in beings outside of the computer world, the users, beings who uh, are more powerful than master control. Master control is not only acting as a god to these programs, it is also attempting to take over the human world. Uh, it considers itself their master even though they are its creator. So meanwhile in the human world, uh, former Incom employee Flynn is attempting to hack into the MCP to prove that he's the author of a video game called Space Paranoids. And while he's trying to hack the Incom system, he is zapped by the MCP, digitized, not killed, digitized, taken into the game grid, into the MCP itself, turns it into a program where then he uses the Tron program and Flynn together working with their magic frisbees to destroy the MCP, master control is destroyed, Flynn is squirted back out somehow into his human form, completely unharmed, missing no limbs, and in hand he has a printout on a dot matrix printer, so it is true that he is the author of the video game Space Printer, is making him the CEO of the corporation, Incom. At that point, he gets a black helicopter and a pointy lapel suit and <laughs> some apparent threesome with his ex-girlfriend and this guy who wrote the Tron program. He greets his friends with this inexplicable rupture of a phrase, greetings programs. Now again, he only used this while he was on the game grid. So this means he either told his friends, here's what happened. I was sitting at the computer, I was trying to hack in and I was digitized and I was a video game and I beat the MCP and totally won and I'm zapped out and that's why I'm your boss. Or he just says, greetings programs, and they're like, yeah, whatever, you're, you're, the, you're the CEO, we'll do whatever you say. Um, so it makes no sense. It's a completely nonsensical rupture in the film. And maybe you just think, oh, it's just a Disney film. So what does it matter? I mean, we know Disney doesn't have to make a logical sense. They just make kids' films and have nice, clean endings. So maybe there's a little bug. Um, <laughs> I suggest that this seeming error in the entire movie Tron itself are symptoms of an underlying paranoid cosmology, which has itself become a symbolic system which informs the way technology is imagined. And to explain why this is true, we need to jump back about 3,000 years to the origin of the art of memory. So the art of memory, as I, again, I'm sure you're all aware, is a tool of classical rhetoric where you mentally walk through halls and temples and spatialize the things that you're trying to remember and you use symbols in this virtual realm to remember large bodies of information. And for thousands of years, this was a necessary part of a classical education. It was simply what you had to do if you wanted to do anything with information up until there was cheap paper and writing implements. 
Um, <laughs> so although this was a very standard tool of an education throughout up until the Renaissance, um, the origin story of this is gruesome, and it begins with a poet named Simonides. According to Cicero, Simonides was invited to deliver a poem at the banquet of a nobleman named Scopius. So he recited his poem with half dedicated to his host. Scopius is great. Thanks for the food we ate. And then he dedicated the other half of the poem to the gods Castor and Pollux. So <laughs> um, Scopius told uh, Simonides that here's half your fee. Go get the other half from Castor and Pollux. He stiffed the poet. So later during that banquet, a message was sent uh, to Simonides. There's uh, two men waiting for you outside. So Simonides goes outside. The two men were gone. While he was outside, the entire banquet hall collapsed, smashing everyone to a bloody pulp. Flat. Unrecognizable. <laughs> so Simonides was the only survivor. He was the only one who was able to identify these smashed remains, these smashed corpses, by remembering where they sat at dinner. The, the parents of the dead wanted to give them a proper burial. Where is my son? And it was, uh, remember, you were sitting three over there, and so this blob of meat you may bury. Um, and he thought, oh my god. What a great idea for memory technology. So here's an illustration of this sequence. He goes out, the group collapsed. This is the sanitized version. Group collapse means everyone is crushed to a hideous pulp. Um, <laughs> Scopius comes back in. Pac-Man then regenerates the life forms of, through his memory. And we have the arts of memory. So this became a classical tool of rhetoric until there were implements where we could actually record memory onto uh, non-volatile substrates. So <laughs> um, this was what you had to learn. And one of the specific tools of this is actually using graphic or shocking images to make a stronger connection within the memory. So you would associate strange images in the memory space, and that would create a stronger symbolism and crystallize more forms into the piece of information that you're trying to remember. More mental threads leading to that piece of data. And so although this is a classical tool which has been supplanted by more powerful mnemonic techniques, it is still something that is learned. And there are memory competitors today which still use this technique, which is thousands of years old, to remember huge bodies of information. And it appears in strange cultural artifacts. For example, Hannibal Lecter used it to remember people's addresses where he had a memory palace. So this memory palace um, <laughs> offers these amazing opportunities for horrifying imagery, using these ridiculous symbols to mesh data. Um, and it was physicalized to a certain extent, that people would actually uh, create external versions of these memory palaces. So there would be memory gardens where uh, the landscape itself would be filled with symbols which people could walk through both physically and mentally in order to remember pieces of information that they were trying to recall. Which brings us to actual physical spaces of memory, um, <laughs> information architecture in the sense of building an architecture to remember. Um, this is the memory theater of Giulio Camillo, um, which uh, <laughs> was a, a system which he proposed uh, to his backers, uh, much like modern memory technologies, he tried to find uh, venture capital to build this system, which was designed uh, around mystical symbolism. So the rose would be a certain type of uh, symbol, and the columns would be astrological symbols, and it was increasing and decreasing levels of abstraction. So theoretically, he suggested that you could remember any piece of information in the universe by simply going through this grid of 48 uh, different possible drawers. You're like, let's see, uh, uh, Aries, and then you go up two rows to this level of abstraction, and then there's a delicious recipe for cookies. So, um, <laughs> and he more than hinted to his financial backers that this random access encyclopedia would also convey a certain power on someone who stood within the center of it. It was designed as a theater with the user of this encyclopedia standing on the stage looking out into the audience. But the idea um, with using these mystical symbols is that uh, there would be a certain degree of power over the universe conveyed to the person who used the system. The knowledge of the universe was itself a certain power. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, he tried to sell us to his uh, financial backers uh, very strongly. Apparently, it was built at a certain point, but then burned down, so we have no evidence of what happened. Um, another example of this type of system 
describing order in the universe was the curiosity cabinet. And to modern eyes, they often look like a jumble of stuff, literally just a junk pile. Oh, look, a cool shell. But they were actually designed with an underlying uh, order that described systems of the universe. And largely, the universe is divided into fours. At the time, they thought there were four continents, four seasons, four cardinal directions. And so what looks like a big mess to us is actually this very clear system of fours. So you have the bone over here and the coral over there. And so clearly, there is a god. Um, and <laughs> these systems, although they began as a combination of sort of a mystical evidence of the underlying order and uh, proof that you were really rich because you could find this cool stuff, they evolved into natural history collections, which themselves evolved into finer and finer grain distinctions from these original four categories into the uh, categories which we now use today. They evolved into museum collections and university disciplines. So this underlies our understanding of the way that the world works, beginning with the, this origin story of people trying to find and describe the order of the universe with these tools. So moving on to information machines. Um, <laughs> we'll begin with uh, this fellow, Ramon Lull. You may know him as Ramundus. Uh, he was a 13th century Catalan monk. Uh, he actually wrote the first major work in Catalan. Hmm, true story. Um, and he describes something called the Ars Magnus, which he imagined would be a debating tool for converting Muslims to the Christian faith through logic, reason. It'll look like this. So <laughs> he'll go up to a Muslim in the 13th century. Hello, I'm Ramundus. Um, this is, as you can see, I is to E as C is to H, and therefore God. So you should be a Christian. So <laughs> uh, apparently he was stoned to death by angry Muslims. Um, <laughs> But his theories and techniques were a major influence on Leibniz, who <laughs> came up with a theory, uh, which he called monads, which described the underlying unity of the universe, that there is this all-encompassing one that was underlying everything, uh, a principle of pre-established harmony. So <laughs> one. Um, so each monad follows this pre-programmed set of instructions peculiar to that particular monad. Um, <laughs> and. Later, uh, Giordano Bruno uh, picked up on these theories from both uh, Ram Ramondus Lull and uh, um, <laughs> actually Leibniz came later. Uh, so they were together in this thread of trying to understand how there was an order to the universe. So Giordano Bruno came up with a similar system with these concatenated wheels, describing uh, these hidden structures by rotating these symbols within each other so that they would describe relationships which were not apparent but which would become apparent by using them as a code. It became a system uh, very similar to early cryptographic systems, but he explicitly used them as magical tools. Um, <laughs> so being a Dominican monk in the uh, 16th century, um, if that wasn't bad enough that he was coming up with these magical wheels, he also said there were infinite stars and planets, uh, and oh yeah, there is no god. So in 1600, he was burned at the stake. Um, and if you visit Rome, you can see his statue. They made them in a nice little piazza there for him. Um, jumping forward a few centuries to a more famous uh, information machine, this is Charles Babbage, who described the difference engine, um, which is considered the first description of a modern workable computing device. It was never actually built by him, because as he described it, the tolerances of the time wouldn't have allowed the technology to operate. But in the 20th century, using his plans and using modern uh, engineering, it was built, and the darn thing works. They plugged it in, and boom, boom, look, it's chugging away. So um, he actually designed an operational computing device. Uh, he uh, met Ada Lovelace when she was 17. Ada um, is the only legitimate child of the poet Byron. Um, <laughs> and this is the image of her uh, on the software boxes. She is considered the first computer programmer because based on this hypothetical description of a machine by Babbage, she described the possibility of making the machine perform different operations. And then she jumped ahead and said, and if it could perform different operations, you could give it a misinstruction. And so she described the first software and the first software bug. Um, so this is a romantic image, uh, the, uh, one of the armed forces in America named a programming language after her, Ada. Um, <laughs> now this is actually an a photograph of her, probably close to the time of her death, around age 36. And what happened was <laughs> she managed to kick the heroin that the doctors forced on her, but then the doctors bled her to death while trying to cure her uterine cancer. So, <laughs> and also interesting side note, Lord Byron also bled to death by his doctors. So this is something that comes up a lot in the history of information technology, and I, it's called an iatriogenic disease, 
um, iatro from Dr. Uh, genic cause. So it's a disease that is actually caused by attempting to cure something. You're trying to fix the problem. You're just trying to heal what's wrong, and everything goes to hell. So the history of information technology is entwined with this uh, sort of reverse of the intent uh, back on what the result is. And to investigate that further, we have to uh, look at the entire history of the hermetic tradition. Um, <laughs> The entire Western Hermetic tradition will begin with Hermes. Uh, he's a pouty boy. He was the messenger and translator of the gods. Um, and the word hermeneutics comes from uh, <laughs> the fact that he uh, liked to play tricks on people who he was delivering the messages to. He would reinterpret the message to his own ends. So the medium which is attempting to transfer the message itself becomes an interpretive tool. This is where we get hermeneutics. Hmm. Um, now, another uh, aspect of the word uh, Hermes and hermeneutic is hermetic, which is graphic symbolism, which is exceedingly obscure, convoluted, vague. For example, this chicken, what is it? It's the rooster of Hermes. What does that mean? Who knows? Um, hermetic also derives from uh, the term used by alchemists to describe an airtight seal that they use for distillation. Um, so in terms of the hermetic tradition, there was this uh, semi-mythical uh, figure called Hermes Trismegistus, thrice great Hermes, who is a syncretism of Egyptian and Greek gods. And this figure, this uh, blending of cultures and mythologies became a f an important role in the Renaissance Neoplatonic revival. Um, <laughs> and this thread, of the Neoplatonic revival and the Hermetic tradition runs through secret societies and scholarly organizations, which became the uh, scientific researchers and famous historical figures, which we've now cleansed of their weirdness and have become the uh, uh, vaunted figures of the origins of science. Um, so this is an emblem from the Rosicrucians, who appeared mysteriously in the 15th century in, the, in Europe. Uh, Robert Flood was a famous magician, alchemist, Rosicrucian. He was also an uh, engineer and defense contractor, one, an early uh, um, <laughs> expert in some of these uh, new technologies, especially regarding warfare. And Leonardo da Vinci was a renowned engineer and scientific in, uh, innovator, but he was also a renowned heretic and pervert. So these threads follow through to modern day Freemasons, enduring secret societies, which use these same symbols based on the secrets of architecture and engineering, but also uh, they consider them secrets that date back to Egyptian hermetic symbolism. And these uh, belief systems underlie uh, certain political and social systems, which persist to this very day, <laughs> um, which we can find uh, in various arrays of secret symbolism regarding people being secret Muslims, which is also something that uh, the Shriners consider themselves, who are the upper level Masons. Um, this thread of the Hermetic tradition, the underlying Hermetic tradition below the respected Masonic traditions, uh, can be traced most infamously through Aleister Crowley, who uh, was the central figure of the 20th century Hermetic uh, beliefs. He, uh, <laughs> when he was a young lad before the heroine, he entered the Golden Dawn, uh, and this was a um, a magical order in England, which also included uh, several famous people, including uh, William Betuler Yeats, who kicked him out for being too weird, man. So um, <laughs> he struck out on his own. He climbed some mountains. He took a lot of drugs. And then at one point, uh, in, while inside the Great Pyramid, he contacted an unearthly entity named Iwas, who dictated unto him the Book of the Law. Um, so Crowley used this communication to found his own magical order, the Ordo Templi Orientis, which is based on a system of thelema, which is the Greek word for will. So his law, his underlying principle, do what thou will, should be the whole law. Will was a central underlying uh, unit that he used for his symbolic work. So he's become a figure <laughs> that means a lot of things uh, throughout the 20th century because he became fairly infamous. Uh, also a drug addict his entire life, um, not very closeted. Um, <laughs> and also interestingly, his doctors apparently got him hooked on heroin too uh, when they first prescribed him morphine. And when he was dying in 1947, uh, his final doctor died within uh, 24 hours and it said that the doctor refused to continue his heroin prescription, so Crowley cursed him and he died. Um, so. Some call him the wickedest man alive because apparently someone slipped up in some magical ritual, not really fair. Uh, but <laughs> whether or not he's considered wicked or not, uh, whether his ideas uh, are weird or perverted, um, he has been massively influential upon all modern occultists and also his ideas and symbolism show up in a broad swath of popular culture. So he can be found uh, represented in various strange ways and sort of unexpected uh, emblems of his re of, as a reference point back to this tradition. Um, 
Now, a common philosophical basis of this Hermetic tradition is Neoplatonism. And the Neoplatonic worldview is characterized by an extreme dualism. So the idea that there's these ideal forms that are outside the universe, and uh, man is this microcosm of this, this true world that's outside. And the idea that the apparent physical world is just a reflection of the real world, which is beyond our apparent understanding. It also uh, includes the idea that manipulation of these forms, these ideal forms, could convey power over the true universe and therefore, therefore over the physical world. So Neoplatonism obviously comes from Plato, uh, oddly enough. Um, and you've probably heard of the cave, the allegory of the cave, which describes this idea of the universe being a world of shadow, which is simply a, a representation of the real world which we don't directly perceive, which is very similar to the idea of avatars, which, of course, we find in Tron, um, the vice president of the Enron Corporation, evil, um, who is represented in the electronic world with his shadow form, Sark, with little devil horns. Um, now, the thing about Neoplatonism is that it's considered OK. They're the good pagans. Because um, <laughs> Plato is all right. Thumbs up, Plato. Um, but the actual Neoplatonic uh, philosophers were themselves more uh, heretical, uh, deeply heretical. And <laughs> uh, a lot of what influenced their belief system in terms of this dualistic worldview was based on a cosmology called Manichaeanism. Manichaea what? Manichaeanism which was actually one of the most widespread philosophies in the early uh, part of the first millennium. Through the seventh and eighth century, it was actually the most widespread religion in the world. So originating in the Middle East, it spread out to uh, Europe and to China, where it uh, influenced several strands of Buddhism, including being a major influence on Tibetan Buddhism. So why haven't you heard that much about it? What, what, where is this Manichaeanism? Well, what happened was uh, it was brutally oppressed. It was considered the worst possible sin by the Catholic Church. So <laughs> any emblem of Manichaean, oh, no, you, you're simply dead. So um, it's strange because St. Augustine himself, played here by Val Kilmer, was actually a passionate Manichaean for over a decade of his life until it was decreed a heresy punishable by brutal and hideous death, at which point he became an extremely good, pious Catholic. Um, Manichaean texts themselves were burned at the stake. No text was allowed to survive. It had Manichaeanism tainted upon it. So there were actually no direct textual representations of this philosophy until the Nag Hammadi codexes were found in 1947. Um, Manichaeanism is an example of uh, Gnosticism, which is a very broad term for an array, an array of traditions which describe this cosmological dualism. And they're also the basis of much of the Hermetic tradition. So the idea of Gnosticism as a broad swath is that uh, the the apparent world is not just uh, fake, it's actually a machine generated to lie to us, to keep us entrapped, to keep the light, which is our true being, encased in these shells of illusion. So the true world is outside of all these shells that we can't even perceive, and we are simply in the lowest dungeon. Um, <laughs> um, and breaking through this shell of illusion becomes the 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 thing that you pursue for your entire life. So what is apparently the god of this world is actually the prison keeper who is keeping you entrapped in your false beliefs. Um, so you're praying to actually the person who is uh, imprisoning you in this illusion. Um, <laughs> and we're trapped here by the Demiurge, which is who is called, sometimes named Yaldobath, who ensnares humanity in this sleep and illusion. So rather than being in, a, in the real world, we're actually in the lowest pit of hell. This is the pit of fire itself. So the Gnostics had good news, that there was a way out, that you could directly perceive the truth and light within you, that um, you could look beyond this machine generating these illusions, and any individual could break through the shell of a falsehood, and you could perceive the invisible realm of knowledge beyond this physical embodiment. Every person is a being of pure light, united in the ocean of oneness of higher knowledge. In short, the Gnostics were hippies. They were anti-authoritarians. They tended to believe in an individual revelation of truth. And many of them lived in egalitarian harmony. The church could not let this perversion stand. <laughs> they hated Gnostic heresies above all else. You could do anything except be a Gnostic. Um, <laughs> uh, I actually looked up in the Catholic Encyclopedia, which was published in 1907, which they've translated onto the web. And they still describe Manichaeans and Gnostics as the evil which had to be eradicated by any means. Um, so this is the 20th century version of this Catholic ideology that persists to this very day. Um, <laughs> any Gnostics they could get their hands on were shown what for in no uncertain terms. 
Um, but the church failed to wipe out the Gnostic heresy entirely. Uh, they tried, but the damn hippies kept spreading. So at one point in the 12th and 13th centuries, an arguably Gnostic sect, the Cathars, were uh, prospering in south of France. They were eating vegetarian food, they were meditating, they were living communally, they were being respectful to women, and they were rejecting the authority of the Holy Mother Church. And the goddamn hippies were spreading. So at this point, Pope Innocent uh, was not pleased. Um, he asked the Cathars, he asked them nicely, please, a convert to Catholicism. And the Gnostic hippies told the man to stick it, and they kept on grooving. So this made the Pope very angry. And you wouldn't like Pope Innocent III when he's angry. <laughs> so he took action. Note the action figure. Did he use the comfy chair? No. In one of his attacks, the nice attack, he, uh, a relatively gentle part of his campaign, he took the entire city of Carcassonne and forced him out into the wilderness naked let them die on their own, didn't kill them directly. He was trying to be nice, um, but that didn't work. So he had to keep going. He declared a crusade, the only intra-European crusade, which actually marked the origins of the Inquisition. The Cathars in this crusade against France were slaughtered, men, women, children, babies, puppies, all dead. It looked like this. First the church sent in their giant teams of rat riders squealing like banshees, woe unto the Gnostic hippies. Then the bird beak bishops came in swinging holy sticks of righteousness. It was hard out there for a Gnostic. So there's a historic basis to this cosmology being paranoid, um, especially since it led to the Spanish Inquisition. So you may think no one expected it. Unless you were a Gnostic, then you totally saw it coming because the entire universe is a lie that's just designed to imprison you and kill you. So you're not really paranoid if they're out to get you. <clears throat> This brings us to the future. A modern version of this dualistic technology mapped onto modern information technology and the idea of progress. It's called techno-gnosticism, the idea that there's this world within information technology that is more real than the physical world, that can bring power upon the physical world if you have the right investors, you have use very shiny colors. Um, and there's actually a book by Eric Davis called Technosis, which investigates the idea of this mythology woven within the way people think about how they build and use technology today. Um, and so people would design things based on these mystical traditions, such as this version of the uh, memory theater, um, done with 3D, so it's more powerful. Um, <laughs> and also, this is the map by Francis Yates, uh, a scholar from the 60s, describing the memory theater. This is Burning Man from 2007. Coincidence? So there's also the idea of leaving behind this world of meat and dirt, this world of illusion, and elevating yourself into the world of light and information and truth, leaving the body behind, the singularity to cyber rapture, um, <laughs> beings uploaded into the new sphere. Uh, and we see this uh, represented in Tron, uh, the persecution for these Gnostic beliefs, that these beings of light, an interesting twist, are being persecuted for believing that there's a world of truth beyond their realm. Gnostic themes in popular culture uh, are often related to works by Philip K. Dick, um, <laughs> almost entirely. Uh, basically, um, if it's Philip K. Dick, it's sort of Gnostic. Um, so this is a Philip K. Dick bot. Um, and even describing Philip K. Dick as this figure, um, the story becomes sort of twisted in this way, because this bot was supposed to just uh, say quotes by Philip K. Dick, and he would talk to you, mm, I'm Philip K. Dick. Then the guy uh, who built it was moving it to another location and had the head in a separate part of his luggage Philip K. Dick's head has been lost and never found again, which is exactly what you would expect to happen. So um, Philip K. Dick's narratives themselves are, are fairly cinematic, and they're increasingly popular as these paranoid modern mythologies. For example, uh, Total Recall, it, which is, for me, a political film. I'm from California. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger is either a heroic uh, savior or a deranged homicidal lunatic. Um, <laughs> and is he really the governor? Is this some horrible dream? Um, now, it, it dates back throughout a uh, history of uh, European traditions in which um, uh, the relationship of Kabbalism and Gnosticism is tied together. So there are these overtly Gnostic themes um, when Walter Benjamin is describing a series of history. And so this Gnostic and Kabbalistic uh, entwining occurs. Um, and these themes also uh, continue to reoccur in uh, classics like Blade Runner, um, <laughs> based on Philip K. Dick's story, uh, Videodrome, not Philip K. Dick, strange, um, and uh, Neuromancer. 
um, which did win the Philip K. Dick Award. So <laughs> Neuromancer, published after Tron, uh, is the story of two artificial intelligences which work to bring about their own apparent physical destruction in order to become decentralized consciousnesses which are freed from their substrate to evolve across the global information network and become godlike beings. Um, <laughs> as you all are well aware. Um, so it's worth noting that Kenar Reeves was in Johnny Mnemonic, which was based on a script by William Gibson, referencing uh, the original Neuromancer, and of course he continues to reappear in these explicitly Gnostic films, these direct uh, religious references. Um, <laughs> and as Scanner Darkly, again, based on another Philip K. Dick a novel, is a uh, a techno-gnostic idea that the world as we see it is this illusion. And for a while, especially around the turn of the millennium, there were a long string of these techno-gnostic pieces of culture. The 13th Floor, uh, which was, came out the same year as The Matrix. This is actually the end of the film, so now you don't need to see the film. It's fake! Um, so <laughs> <laughs> there's a simulation. Oh, no. Um, and uh, a group of somebodies is controlling something, for example, in the movie Dark City, um, which uh, is not only a Gnostic film, but is also a noir film. Um, <laughs> Another uh, noir film which embodies some of these Gnostic themes but in a more quiet way is The Big Lebowski, which came out the same year in 1998, which describes these layers of illusion and deception, this concealing of the true nature of reality in which some new shit comes to light. Gnosis being the Greek word for light, illumination. Um, <laughs> and then probably my favorite uh, example of technonostic culture, um, 1988's uh, They Live, not written by Philip K. Dick, but uh, starring Roddy Rowdy Piper and containing the longest wrestling scene outside of a wrestling movie. Uh, it literally goes on for uh, like 20 minutes. They actually have four fake endings. You're sure it's over. Oh, then, oh, pile driver. And they're wrestling about putting the magic sunglasses on so you can see through the fake world into the real world which underlies it, which you can see only with this gigantic tool that you stick on your head, a tool which allows you to see the information hidden with the, within the apparent physical forms of the universe, which are just lying to you. They're just trying to keep you entrapped, man. Here's the real message. Why don't you look behind what's going on? Why don't you see that the world's actually a prison? All our apparent consumerist freedoms are actually the chains that keep you enslaved. You're just making hair dues for evil alien overlords who manufacture this entire system just so they can enforce humans to be nice him at the bar. So it's kind of a techno-gnostic Marxist film. Um, and I, I think if you look really close, this is actually Obey brand beer. Um, so <laughs> this is after the wrestling scene, they're wearing their sunglasses. What's interesting about this film, in addition to the uh, wrestling scene, is um, the cultural references which have spun out from it, intentionally or unintentionally, which have become the, their own uh, dystopian product research mechanism. Um, <laughs> the only way to see through this illusion is to buy this tool, um, these great sunglasses. Um, and this is, um, <laughs> this is uh, <laughs> sort of an, a strange example of intentionally or unintentionally, it regenerates itself as an advertising mechanism where people are now trying to make the world of they live a reality with augmented reality where you wear this incredibly sexy hat and you get to see the real world within the illusion of the physical space where you can look beyond mere appearances and see the world of information and then you can build a future based on this dystopian blueprint blockbuster sponsored your reality um and a more well-known example of this is cyberspace, which has its origin myth in the book Neuromancer, where William Gibson tossed off this word. He was looking for an environment to do his uh, space cowboy novel and described a consensual hallucination, a graphic representation of all the data in the universe abstracted from every computer and system. Ah, thought everybody. That sounds great. Let's build that. Even though he did thought of it as, as a dystopian environment, which was a completely horrific environment to live in, everyone thought, wonderful, we're going to make that thing. We're going to be creator gods. We're going to be an alien race probing the lives of our technologically enslaved programs. Um, <laughs> and this is the origin myth mythology of cyberspace, which uh, influences uh, culture such as Billy Idol's seminal uh, 1995 album, um, where he uses Greek font to prove his cyberness. Um, so at the dawn of the graphical web, cyber was used to reference anything that was vaguely related to technology. If it was shiny or beepy or synthetic-y or uh, kind of synthetic drugs, um, silver uh, face paint, a shiny fabric. Um, now, you may laugh, but we've all been there. And I want to point something out. <laughs> 
<laughs> this uh, cyber Gnostic, I, <laughs> I mean, yes, there's the obvious pleasure of just putting him up on the screen, but if you notice, he's actually thinking about this a little more deeply than maybe you realize, because on his hand, he has written uh, <laughs> Unix permissions command, where he has uh, changed permissions on his own hand so that he and his group are not able to execute. Only the world can execute his hand. He's powerless over his own hand. It's, that's dark, man. That's dark. <laughs> so <laughs> this, this mythology continues to persist. So now we have meta cyber cyberpunks, where a cyberpunk in Second Life using mechanical inputs uh, on a digital avatar, none of which actually relates to any of the function of these mechanisms, but they're all mythological steampunky metaphors. Um, <laughs> but cyber, although it became a word like Smurf at a certain point, uh, doesn't mean techno or gadget or shiny. Uh, <laughs> although I do think this fashion is coming back in a big way. Um, cyber uh, means control. It is the word for control, coined by Norbert Wiener in his uh, book Cybernetics in 1947 from the Greek word for steersman, Kubernetes. So he's specifically referring to the science of feedback and control, where not just mechanical control, but the idea of a system which is able to use its output to change how it reacts and input more effectively. Um, so he described this as a system which would be incredibly useful for engineering purposes, but also for biology, but also social control. So that if you had a system uh, which had a social feedback loop so that people uh, liked the way it was responding to their feedback, then people would increasingly desire that control. It would be a machine that automatically produces fun, that people would want control. And so in the 40s, as he was describing this, he created a new science. And it was like, oh, great, wow, we're going to make tons of money. He was like, yeah, you know, we're all actually going to be enslaved by our desires. Um, <laughs> he was also, uh, Norbert Wiener was a pacifist. So. After World War I, um, he was a brilliant mathematician and designed uh, many of the systems that allowed many weapon systems to be built. But after the war, he, he realized that mathematicians couldn't claim innocence, that they had to uh, recognize that they were not just working on clean equations, they were actually working on the death machines themselves. So he refused to work on any defense-related projects after that, and he lost his clearances, which kept him away from the technologies, the early computing technologies, which would have allowed him to continue his work. However, a colleague of Wiener's uh, remained close to the action, Vannevar Bush. Now, Vannevar, um, <laughs> No relation, by the way, I checked, um, was one of the brilliant uh, engineers who made those death machines, actually made them. Um, and during World War II, he was the chief death machine engineer. Um, and here we look at him in his grandfatherly spectacles. Um, here is a saucy engineering lad with his nerd glasses. Here he is uh, with his flyboy haircut hacking away. Um, he built some of the earliest electromechanical computing systems um, on the wheels of steel, working the ones and twos. Um, so these machines were these massive constructs of wood and glass, thousands of whirring brass cogs, literally steampunk, where they used electric motors to spin these devices to compute equations um, that were extremely complex and difficult to maintain. To compute an equation, you had to actually move some shafts and gears into place to get a new equation. You get your nice suit all dirty from the oil. Um, so why did they build these difficult, elaborate devices to make artillery tables? And the story is that when you created a new gun, a new artillery weapon, you couldn't just ship it out and have people start shooting away. You actually had to have a way to aim it. So the way they originally did this was shoot it here, shoot it here, shoot it here, take years, make a book of those, give the book, and you get the gun. And with the book and the gun, you can kill. So <laughs> that took too long. So they make these machines, zzz, it takes a couple years less, you get a book faster, and then people can kill faster, and then everybody's happy, except for the dead people. So <laughs> this, however, although quite innovative, is not always most famous for. He's best known as the godfather of hypertext. Um, and this is based on an article in the Atlantic Monthly, just one little article that he wrote where he described a bunch of clever scientific devices, wars over while we have uh, scientific spy cameras on our foreheads. Um, so he also described a device called the Mimex, um, <laughs> which is a contraction of memory external. Um, so he described this information machine, fairly radical for 1945, kind of in a Jules Verne kind of way. Zing, zing, oh look, it's a personal information device. Um, so that's kind of interesting, but it's actually, again, not what he's remembered for. The Mimex um, <laughs> involved a file system which uh, had a metaphor of connecting information, and this is what is remembered. This is what is considered important about it. The Mimex organized information not with a hierarchy, not with a folder system, but by will. So you decide this connects to this just because I say so, I'm the researcher, and boom, by your will, which he actually uses the term in the essay, then those terms are connected, and you have this thread of research. Um, <laughs> so the metaphor becomes the important thing. Now, 
here's the thing about analog. Um, analog's a physical reflection, wiggly line analog movement. Um, so it's possible to actually read the information without translating it through a metaphor. With digital information, it's a mathematical abstraction. You can't just squint really hard at the white noise and figure out what the equation is. It needs a metaphor to become legible, an interface so the humans can actually interact with that complexity and that data. So these metaphors become the most powerful thing for imagining how these systems will work. But Vannevar was actually stuck with, I don't know, I've got this great thing, it'll use microfilm, and there'll be a desk, it'll be really nice. You like desk, you know, nice wood. Um, so uh, there's actually a term in the jargon file uh, to Vannevar because he imagined that these technologies would sort of continue on a recognizable path, that they wouldn't have these dramatic jumps. So he imagined the computers of the future would be these skyscrapers full of vacuum tubes um, cooled by Niagara Falls, while his colleagues were inventing solid state technology at the, at the very same time. So he didn't see that this, this technology, this metaphor that he was describing, this innovative thing, which is actually still used, he didn't see that the metaphor is a significant thing, not the little cog that had the microfilm on it. But 30 years later, people did recognize that this metaphor was the vital thing, and they created hypertext. This is Ted Nelson's version of it, and then uh, the web. Now, the weird thing is this is actually not the first modern description of hypertext. The first modern description was actually Paul Otlet, who, um, in 1934, a Belgian guy named Paul Otlet described the radiated library, or the televised book, and he tried to actually make it. He tried to start cataloging information into a cross-link system, which he called the mundanium, the entire catalog of all the world's information, and he built it with these card files. Um, so he described hypertext and actually tried to do it with paper, but he was a pacifist. So <laughs> um, he has been forgotten by history. And the Mimex is the true form designed in 1945. So the Mimex, designed by this defense engineer, evolved into this hypertextual system, uh, which uh, then influenced Tim Berners-Lee when he was describing his mesh proposal um, in 1989, which then evolved into a combination, which we know as the internet, in which everything now makes total sense. Now, the idea is this is magical thinking. Um, <laughs> that the idea that you can solve this problem by simply uh, linking these things together, um, you're actually using the principle of will, which Crowley described in his magical system of philemma. And also in an anthropological sense, um, <laughs> there are two types of magic. Sympathetic magic, where uh, things which appear to be connected, uh, which look like each other, can influence each other, and things which were connected, like hair and fingernails, can influence each other. So what you're describing with a hypertextual system is uh, a system that operates by will and uses these anthropological forms of magic. It's inherently a paranoid process. It's a magical machine. Um, <laughs> and by calling it paranoid, it's not necessarily uh, criticism, because when you look at the root word of the, par of the word paranoid, para means beside, and Noose means mind. So when you describe a paranoid machine, you're actually describing a mind which is beside itself, a mind which is outside of your mind telling the story back to you. So the mimics is this paranoid machine, a poetic device for telling our own stories back to us in this new shape. But Bush wasn't the only one to make use of this paranoid process. At the same time that he was describing the Mimex, before he published it, but while he was still imagining this idea, um, another guy uh, in the 30s was describing the paranoid critical method, in which you use odd connections simply at will and make them do a certain con conceptual work for you as a poetic device. So to give you an example, show you what I mean. Let's say you pull a concept out of the air. Let's say, like, a uh, telephone. And then you pull another concept out of the air, like, I don't know, a uh, lobster. And you put them together. Lobster Phone. Awesome. So <laughs> this was <laughs> this is actually the lo this phone it, well, in 1936 was actually uh, created the same year that Vannevar Bush was writing, as we may think, before it was published. And the year he published, uh, as we may think, was um, <laughs> uh, when Dolly was coming out with his uh, emblems like persistence of memory. This image here. Um, so. <laughs> There's a strange connection where um, Dolly, uh, showing his work in New York in the first time in the 30s, was actually showing it at the same time this brilliant engineer just up the coast was describing uh, the way to make external memory into a poetic device. So, um, <laughs> and the thing is, this keeps coming up in the history of information technology, that there's these uh, paranoid histories that relate back to the things that we think of as um, ordinary uh, information. Oh, I got to go for this very quickly. Um, Mammoth Cave in Kentucky is one of the largest case systems in the world. The first explorer of it was Stephen Bishop, who's a slave, who explored it under orders of his master. So he took tourists into the cave, and he was literate. He knew uh, Greek and knew certain mythology, so he named these uh, with these terms like the River Styx, the Echo River, Hall of the Mountain King. And his maps uh, and descriptions became the most complete versions of this cave system uh, for over 100 years. Um, and he was... Uh, 
died in uh, 19, er, 1857. This is actually, um, <laughs> he was a former slave, but this is actually a Civil War tombstone because the soldier didn't pay, so they just gave it to Stephen Bishop. Um, so 100 years later, hello, um, this guy, Will Crowther, uh, in the 70s, were exploring these caves. He and his wife, uh, who were looking through these caves, and he was working at a defense contractor, uh, BBN, who was on the ARPANET development team. And so, um, <laughs> Let's go off topic here and actually describe the entire internet. So the internet, um, as you know, <laughs> he's pointing here uh, at the camera system, um, was designed in the midst of the Cold War um, when American computer networks were vulnerable to Soviet attack. They relied on highly centralized servers, and just a few nodes were taken out by the Ruskies, then we'd be unable to launch our own retaliatory strike, we'd be dead in the water, and every, everyone would, like, our Soviet communism would rule. So this nerd stepped in to help. This is uh, Paul Baran, who at the Rand Institute came up with the idea of distributed networks. So instead of using a centralized server for its survival, he could use uh, any node to communicate information to another node, um, dynamically routing their packets. This model of this network became the ARPA net which was designed as a post-apocalyptic vengeance tool, uh, a means to strike back at the enemy. Uh, the way it worked um, was it was like a cloud, the cloud which you may have heard of, cloud computing, which sounds so nice and fluffy, it's drifting, it's relaxing. Um, but this cloud is a wisp of propaganda because this cloud is actually a tangled mess, which doesn't sound relaxing at all. You wouldn't get investment for that. Um, it also conceals this particular paranoid history because the original point of the cloud was in case our mortal enemy struck us, they flying for Houston, then we could strike back, boom. And then striking back for the grave, our nuclear zombie vengeance would slay our foes. So that's why we have the internet. Thanks. Um, so Will Crowther was working on this. And while he was working on this, um, his wife found the connection to another cave system and proved Mammoth Caves was the largest in the world. She became famous. Uh, they got divorced. So Will Crowder is now a divorced dad. He's got to entertain his two young daughters. What does he do? He's a programmer. He's a nerd. He plays D&D. So he does the logical thing. He codes a game. He codes this little text adventure of one of the caves he and his wife explored. And using uh, <laughs> some of Stephen Bishop's names, some of his maps, he designs this little text thing, gives it to the kids. Oh, yeah, it keeps them entertained for a weekend. Um, they go home. Uh, so. <laughs> The thing, he forgets about it, but Crowther is working at the place that invents the internet. So a few years later, a graduate student in Stanford, Don Woods, uh, finds it, rewrites it, calls it adventure, uses some D&D &D references, and again, Stephen Crowther's names, and this becomes the basis for an entire thread of cultural perspectives to this day. So we have text adventures evolving into graphical adventures, evolving to 3D adventures, which evolve into entire multiplayer worlds that are all based on this origin, where a slave was mapping out this world. And now in this world, you can actually learn how to cook uh, wolf meat, and you can work uh, in your consensual hallucination. You can be a burger flipper in your consensual hallucination for entertainment. So through this thread, uh, you can now uh, become a ditch digger and you'll be perfectly happy as long as you have the skin of a teenage hooker. It's literally an imprisoning shell of illusion. And these escalating sexy metaphors are <laughs> Uh, one of the main weapons in terms of this mythology, that cyberspace actually being correlated to your body, that you have this helm of true seeing, and you can use these gestures to make the data and have a magic wand of the sexy costume. These embodied metaphors are often tied to a desire to escape the media entirely, to bypass the interface and become data, to fully translate the body into, into code so there'd be no glove required. And at that point, uh, once we reach that transhuman apotheosis, everything will be perfect. So with this mythology of increasing resolution, uh, we can enter this new heaven where there's grinding retail jobs, uh, burly bouncers and sleazy sex clubs, um, <laughs> and this new cyber heaven will be exactly like Las Vegas. Meanwhile, in the real world, your body remains fixly fixed in place while this metaphor is operating. So this is actually the space of computing from Tron, the cube farm, where actually the entire movie takes place, this space of social control. This is where the programmer, Alan, who wrote the Tron program, while his Tron gladiator is throwing his flaming frisbee throughout the world, he's sitting there in his cubicle staring at a screen. So this idea of a sexy veneer of these cybernetic spaces um, are actually clo um, concealing the world that is these are spaces of control and not necessarily of top-down command. It's a feedback loop of desire where because users want to be jacked in, the system uh, <laughs> um, only reveals itself when they fail to jack in. It only reveals itself through error. <laughs> um, 
So when the system uh, breaks down, it's a bug, um, which is actually first referred to by Thomas Edison uh, in, oh, you know, I just realized this is going to take like 10 minutes more than I have. So I'm just warning you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Edison first described bugs um, when he was working originally with electronics. Uh, they date back to the earliest uh, electronic communication systems, and especially this thing, the Vibroplex bug, um, which has this logo of an electric cockroach on it. Um, and it was uh, known as a bug for its difficulty to operate. When uh, bad operators would use it, they would be buggy operators. The computer bug, however, actually has a specific origin and a physical point. It was Relay 70 panel F of the Mark II Icon Relay calculator at Harvard. And they found, while they were trying to figure out what the hell was wrong with it, a bug, a moth, was in between the two relays. So they plucked it out. They debugged the computer. Here's a close-up, Relay 70. Um, and <laughs> this eventually made its way to the Smithsonian. This is the first actual bug. Um, now, the person who was the boss of the people who found the bug was Grace Hopper, an early computer programmer. Um, she retold this story and is credited with coining the term debugging uh, for computer programs, for finding something, this bug, inside the computer. So Grace Hopper, now I looked for images of Grace Hopper. She became a fairly significant figure in the history of computing, and so there's a lot of her as an old admiral. Um, Finding earlier images, though, it reminded me of something sort of in a paranoid, critical way that if you find uh, Lauren Bacall plus Salvador Dali, you kind of get Grace Hopper. Um, <laughs> so here she is on the uh, Flowmatic. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. She wrote a, a programming language called Flowmatic, just to prove that she had huge style. Um, and this Flowmatic program was a contributor to uh, COBOL. It was sort of the basis of COBOL. And because COBOL became the standard for mainframe computers running most corporations and banks, um, when <laughs> uh, programmers tried to save memory by shaving off two digits off the date, um, they uh, saved some memory, but then we got a problem when the millennium rolled over and this became Y2K. So we owe this back to Grace Hopper in this sort of nonlinear way. Um, <laughs> now, Y2K was this amazing foreshadowing because although the entire uh, civilized world did not self-destruct on New Year's Eve, there was the way uh, it was imagined became a foreshadowing of things that would happen in the new millennium. So we find this strange paranoia, which trust looks, oh, it's quaint, oh, Y2K, oh, remember, remember the innocent days, but actually there was a fear of terrorism, specifically. The Y2K bug will cause the terrorist bombs to fail. Y2K bug being joined by his friend terrorism. And then this whole uh, <laughs> idea of this increase of security around the year 2000, not 2001, um, not 9-11, but uh, <laughs> January 1st, where the new year was, this new millennium was being welcomed in through a security garrison. And I really like this one because this guy looks like Karl Rove. Um, so the idea that uh, on Y2K, we were entering this new uh, realm of security <laughs> and, and literally paranoia. Um, and this is contrasted with some of the way it's usually remembered, that there's this just extravagant, like, woohoo, hey, everything's great, my stock options, hooray, IPO. Um, so this was the peak of the bubble, but also the peak of this underlying paranoia about what was going to happen with this bubble. Um, and it's really well exemplified in the Wired cover of December 1999, where <laughs> it's here we go. But if you look, so they're leaping off into the blue sky. We're going to make money forever. But if you look closer, those wings are never going to hold her up. She is plunging to her inevitable demise. Um, so leaping off a cliff is the, the symbolism that was tied directly to the symbols of optimism, that everything's going to be great, but it's actually an emblem of <laughs> the inevitable crash. Um, here's another paranoid history. Um, in 2001, uh, Hal became homicidal because he had to keep his secret. He had to lie about what he was doing. He had to pass. He was sort of in the closet about his secret. Um, passing as a human is also the criteria for testing an artificial intelligence like Hal, which was described in the Turing test by Alan Turing. Um, Turing was, of course, instrumental in code-breaking World War II. Uh, he basically uh, helped win the war by cracking the Enigma machine, described some of the fundamental concepts of universal computing. He uh, was also found guilty of being a homosexual in 1952 and put on probation, forced to take estrogen, lost his security clearances and his access to all the computing devices he used for his work, which resulted in him not being able to work any further. Uh, he was found dead at uh, age 42 in 1954. Now, in a refreshing change of face, he was not actually burned at the stake, uh, but <laughs> he committed suicide by eating a cyanide-laced apple. Um, <laughs> and it's thought that he may have been reenacting a scene from Snow White, uh, <laughs> which was his favorite fairy tale, um, but he may have been assassinated. Uh, <laughs> all right, I'm going to have to jump forward. Let's see how fast can we go. Synchronicity, which involves Leibniz, and of course, uh, 
Crowley, so the monad. And if we try and look through the roots of the cosmos and the one, not silly, but it's still something underlying this principle. The matrix, the architect, the architect of what? But the underlying principle behind everything, these poetic facts. Could it be Vannevar Bush, who's this poetic revelation? Well, there was MJ-12, where he was actually considered MJ-1, which involved recovery of the flying saucer at Roswell, where the alien overlords took us over. And if you look more closely at this picture, this is actually the first offense director, James Forstall, who maybe committed suicide or maybe was assassinated, but that's conspiracy theory. So let's talk about Roswell, where something actually fell out of the sky. Fell out of the sky. We don't know what happened. Something real. It fell out of the sky. There's a newspaper. What is it, a pot pie? Who knows? It's just some twigs. Um, so the strange thing is this happened in 1947. 1947 was the year of Roswell. 1947 was the year the Nag Hammadi Library was found. 1947 was the year that the first bug was found. 1947 was the year that Alistair Crowley died. 1947 was the year of the National Security Act, which started the CIA, when James Forrestal became the defense secretary who appointed Vannevar Bush the head of all defense agencies. 1947 was the year the first flying saucer was found. 1947, when this object, Ed Roswell, fell out of our epistemological field of view, became the origin of the UFO mythos, and that's why we got Majestic 12, where this guy said that he got some letters from the president, the actual president, and he sent it to his friend, who has security clearance. They checked on it, and it's weird how they all have these beards, and they looked at the signature, <laughs> actual signature of the actual president. And it turns out that Vannevar Bush was the guy who sold us out to the alien overlords, that he was MJ-1, that he was the evil overlord. Now, the thing about Majestic 12 is it was fake, but it kept everyone paranoid looking at it. What the hell's going on? Where are these documents? Why don't we try and find out? Let's not look at the actual black budget. Let's look at Roswell. And so <laughs> who was actually in charge of Roswell? Because when the thing crashed at Roswell, all the records were erased. A month of records were gone. We don't know what happened to them. What happened? The congressman 50 years later from New Mexico tried to find out. Please give me the records. I got weird people asking me what the hell's going on with Roswell. And they couldn't tell him. They were just gone. Who was in charge of all defense security in 1947 when the thing crashed at Roswell? That would be MJ-1, Vannevar Bush. He was actually in charge. He was actually the overlord. He was at the head of the table when they were creating the entire defense intelligence apparatus. He was at the testing of the atomic bomb. He was the one who was in charge of them. You may think he's just a grandfatherly guy who invented hypertext, but no, there's this weird thing going on where he's actually the controlling mechanism, the master control, the central <laughs> control where it could be destroyed because it was centralized. But we see in Tron that if you destroy this centralized control, this artifact of control, the underlying level of control, then you can get rid of the, the mechanism that could be destroyed. <laughs> and <laughs> through the rupture, you, uh, through bugs, you actually manage to uh, alter the way that this is understood. Now, trying to understand this, you are infected and it is an atriogenic disease. You desire to get out. And it's actually something that is manipulating you with the desire to get out. You think you have it under control. You think you have the bugs under control. But actually, that desire to repair the bugs is what's controlling you. Is this really fake? Is this really just a mythology? Is this just symbolism? Or is it somehow tied to what's actually going on? Or is has some new shit come to light, man? Bojard called this situation hyperreal. Now, he didn't mean that, that means it's hyper. He meant that that means there is no outside. That you think it's a simulation, but there is no way out. You think you know kung fu you think you're the webmaster of the world but you're actually just you being used by this mechanism which controls you and, <laughs> and manipulates you into being in this particular subject position where you see yourself reflected so what does it have to do with the end of tron the end of tron as i see it master control is apparently destroyed but it's not control is destroyed it's mastery the singular uh point of control is destroyed it's an error uh, that is uh, rupturing outward. An error, a bug, which is another term for a virus. And the way a virus works is it injects its code into another cell, turning it into a virus factory, which then erupts further and replicates itself. So when Flynn, at the end of Tron, says greeting programs, it's not just a nonsensical rupture. It's actually a fundamental aspect of the symbolic operation of mnemotechnics. It's an indicator that the basis of knowledge and communication, the basis the epistemological roots of understanding the world is belong to them. So when Flynn destroys mass control is released back into the world as CEO of an info capital empire, what we're seeing is a new algorithm in progress, uh, a new vision of the human um, bursting out and infecting everybody with its disease. So <laughs> which direction actually is escape from this situation is not clear. Um, do we go further out, do we go further in, or do you simply reject the premise? And there is simply no clear answer to that. <laughs>